Good evening. My name is Deborah Stokes, Vice President of Administration and Corporate Management at the Asian Development Bank. Along with our host, my colleague, Vice President Bumbung Susan Tono, we would like to thank you for joining today's Asian Impact webinar. I'm pleased to welcome Professor Michael Kramer, who is joining us today as the 56th ADB Distinguished Speaker. Since its establishment in 1982, the Distinguished Speaker Program has been a way for ADB to tap the knowledge of world-renowned scholars and policy practitioners to better understand the development issues of relevance to Asia. Today's event marks a milestone in the program in that it is the first time that we are holding the lecture as a fully virtual event. Let me say a few words about today's distinguished speaker. Throughout his career, Professor Kramer has focused his research on the problems of economic development. As a fresh PhD graduate from Harvard University in the early 1990s, he took a macroeconomic perspective. His influential 1993 Quarterly Journal of Economics article, The O-Ring Theory of Economic Development, provided theoretical insights into the role of skill complementarity in explaining differences in productivity across countries. The model helped to explain why developed and developing, and developing economies can have such different growth paths. A critical turn in his research came when he and his colleagues at MIT directed their focus to understanding the everyday problems faced by poor households. With so many variables at play, how can you know whether people will really benefit from a development program? The answer was to use an analog of laboratory experiments or medical science. In other words, randomized control trials. Professor Kramer and his colleagues took a large number of schools in Kenya that needed considerable support and randomly divided them into different groups. Because chance determined which school got what, there were no average differences between the groups at the start of the experiment. The researchers could thus credibly link later differences in education outcomes to the various forms of support. For example, one such study demonstrated that subsidized deworming treatment was a low cost way to improve children's school attendance. A recent follow-up study has found that giving kids deworming treatment still benefits those children 20 years later. So the children who were treated for intestinal worms in 1999 earn far more than the kids who were not. These contributions have been recognized at the highest level. In 2019, Professor Kramer and his colleagues, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, were jointly awarded the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel, also known as the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics for their experimental approach to alleviating global property, poverty. Let me now turn to the topic of today's lecture. We're currently in the midst of a global pandemic. I think we all know that, the likes of which the world has not faced in a century. Unfortunately, we will not be able to move beyond this crisis until we have a safe, effective COVID-19 vaccine or vaccines. In 2004, Professor Michael Kramer and Dr. Rachel Glenister proposed using Advanced Market Commitments, or AMCs, to encourage research on and access to vaccines against diseases affecting developing countries. An AMC is a legally binding agreement for an amount of funds to subsidise the purchase at a given price of an as yet unavailable vaccine. In 2010, donors committed $1.5 billion to a pilot AMC to help purchase pneumococcal vaccine for low income countries. Three vaccines have been developed and more than 150 million children immunized, saving an estimated 700,000 li 700, lives. In his lecture today, Professor Kramer will draw on his ongoing research on how to provide the right incentives to accelerate vaccine development, as well as ensure the benefits of any discovery are widely distributed. After Professor Kramer's lecture, we have invited ADB's Chief Economist, Yasuyuki Sawada, Director General, sorry, Director General of the Sustainable uh, Development and Climate Change Department, Wu Chong-um, 
and the Director General of the Pacific Department, Leia Gutierrez, to provide their reflections on what the research could mean for ADB's support for its developing members. We hope to provide ample opportunity for the audience to join in the discussion as well. Please include your questions in the Q&A box, or you can like questions that others have asked, and we'll get to as many of them as we can during the time. With that, let me turn the floor over to Professor Kramer. Thank you so much for that, that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today, and uh, I'll, I'll be only virtually. Um, I, I hope to come back in person sometime. I, I, I know that uh, Chief Economist Sawada is doing uh, very exciting work on, on, uh, on trying to, uh, on impact evaluation, which is probably the, the normal area of most of my research. But today I would like to talk about the, the crisis that's affecting us all, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. The, uh, this is joint work with a, a number of, uh, you know, a whole group of, of co-authors who've come together in what we call the Accelerating Health Technology Group. Um, and this includes a number of, of people who worked together with Rachel and me on the, uh, the pneumococcus uh, advanced uh, market commitment for vaccines, which, uh, which as, as Vice President Stokes explained, was a uh, a reward that a number of uh, donors put, put out, a $1.5 billion reward for, that would go to finance purchases of an approved vaccine against pneumococcus that covered the strains in developing countries. Uh, so uh, uh, Rachel Glenister, G uh, Jean Lee, Chris Snyder uh, all worked on that project. Uh, as we began to think about this, case, we realized that in some ways the economics were, were very different. And so we asked a, a group of, of, uh, of additional economists, including uh, uh, experts in contract design like Susan Athey to, uh, to help, uh, help us uh, think through this case. So I'll, I'll explain a bit about some of the differences. Why don't we go on to the next slide? Let me start with the, just, I think we, all are very aware of the, of the costs of the epidemic, the human costs and the economic costs. But it's worth really trying to quantify this in thinking about the, um, the impact of, of getting a vaccine earlier. So the World Bank estimates a $12 trillion loss over the 2020, 21, 2021 period due to COVID-19. That means that every month that we end the epidemic earlier would generate a $500 billion gain to the economy, you know, very roughly. These are crude back of the envelope calculations. And that's, of course, before adding in the mortality and health losses. So speed is really essential. Now, you can contrast that to the normal timeline for developing vaccines. You know, vaccines are very different than drugs. Manufacture is actually very complex, uh, requires uh, installation of, of a un, unique uh, factory and equipment for this. And it requires, and each piece has to be separately licensed and separately tested. Uh, so there's a saying in the industry that the process is the product. Each, each factory, you don't license a vaccine, you license a, a particular factory. Um, and that means that it typically takes three to four years from initial testing of a vaccine to commercial, widespread commercial availability. Normally, because this is a complicated and expensive and risky process, firms only install the capacity, at commercial scale at least, after the trials are complete. And that's the trials will take at least six months. So that means that there's a, a long delay before vaccine is available. Moreover, even when firms do build capacity, they typically build somewhat limited capacity, enough to serve high income markets, but there's usually a long delay, it can be a decade or more, before uh, low and middle income countries are, are served. Let me go to the next slide. I think all of that makes sense for, for a private company in normal times, but I think this is a case where the social value of early capacity investment, uh, by early I mean installing the capacity in parallel with the testing process rather than waiting till it ends, and very large scale capacity investment, um, greatly exceeds the private value. 
You know, why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. First, there are huge epidemiological externalities from taking vaccines. If I take a vaccine that doesn't just benefit me, it benefits many other people. So the social value is going to be greater than the private value. Now, governments therefore do a lot of purchasing, but of course, if governments are doing the purchasing, that creates limits on pricing and, and political constraints on that, perhaps especially in a pandemic. I'm not saying that those aren't warranted, but given that there are limits on pricing, the social gains to expanding capacity rapidly will exceed the, the private gains. And then finally, um, you know, if you install large scale capacity, that may put pressure on prices in high income countries. So all of those factors tend to mean uh, that the social value is great of, of early investment and of large scale investment greatly exceeds the, pri the, the, uh, the private value to the manufacturer. There are some effects that go the other way. There could be hypothetically a business ceiling effect, but that's likely much smaller. And just to give a sense of the relative magnitudes, and, and you know, this is a, uh, these types of calculations can, are always subject to, uh, to debate. But early in the epidemic, when Moderna announced some positive vaccine news, their stock market went up considerably, as you'd expect. In fact, the value of the increase was $5 billion. However, if you look at the gain to the standard and poor overall, that was, that's, of course, that's just the US stock market, that was $810 billion. And that suggests that the private company is just going to capture a tiny fraction of the overall social value of a vaccine. Okay. Um, why don't we go on to the next slide? So if you think that the social value of getting a vaccine early is very high, but the private value might not be, then it would make sense for governments to try to make a deal in advance early on to purchase the vaccine even before the testing is complete so that the companies, the manufacturers can start installing very large scale capacity uh, before they have the results. Of course, it might be worth it, it might not be. That's a quantitative uh, question. But a number of companies, but you know, as, as you'll see, you know, we, we find that it is. And I'll give you a sort of a back of the envelope calculation uh, to start with, and then we do a more sophisticated one later on. Let me give an example here. The US paid AstraZeneca $1.2 billion for 300 million doses, so roughly $4 per dose. Um, other, the US was an early mover and started doing this early, but uh, COVAX um, has, a, has two programs, one which would be funded to cover low-income countries, another where the countries have to pay themselves for middle-income countries. Um, and you know, recently, just yesterday, the World Bank announced a $12 billion commitment um, um, to, to, which for, for COVID-19 in general, but part of that is intended to help countries finance purchases of vaccine. Um, so are these, are these you know, multiple policy moves worth it? Well, you know, what's the advantage? The advantage is if you finance the capacity installation in parallel with testing, rather than wait for the testing to be done, you might get the vaccine available earlier. And you know, we'll, we'll do a calculation assuming this gets it done three months earlier. Most of the talk, uh, that's the scenario we'll look at. We, could, we have a model, happy to share it. Um, by the way, very happy to work with the Asian Development Bank or, or others in, in sharing our model and so that you can adapt it for, for your own needs. Um, um, but what we, what we, so the benefit is you might advance the availability of a vaccine. What's the cost? Well, you might waste money on a vaccine that fails. You know, there's, the, the truth is most vaccines fail. Um, it's very difficult to predict based on early trials whether a vaccine will, will succeed. So there is a, a risk, there's a considerable risk in this. Um, let me show you a back of the envelope calculation to assess whether, you know, whether these were worth it. Uh, should we go on to the next slide? Okay, let's take that US deal that I mentioned. Let's suppose there was only a 10% chance that it would, it would accelerate a vaccine by six months. You know, we obviously don't know the chance, that's a subjective judgment, but um, if, we, if we work with that 10% number, we would see the benefit cost ratio is 45 to one. So it's worth it with even a very low chance of success. And why is that? It's because we're losing, you know, the world economy is losing $500 billion every month 
that, that the epidemic continues. So even with a, a small chance, this is worth it. Another way to put this is um, a $1.2 billion investment would be worth it if we knew for sure it would accelerate the vaccine by just 10 hours. Um, you know, these, it's, it's very, that's partly why I wanted to give quantitative things. We know that there's a huge cost to the epidemic. Uh, we also know vaccines are very expensive, but these are just orders of magnitude apart. Uh, vaccines are expensive, but nowhere near as, as expensive as the epidemic. Um, here's another calculation. You know, imagine that all vaccines had a 10% chance of success. You know, imagine they're independent draws. They're clearly not independent draws, and I think that's very important, but I'm just trying to do a simple calculation. You know, how many vaccines, how many shots on goal would you want? Turns out you would want 37 shots on goal. You know, even if you're only, by the time you get to the 37th candidate, you're pretty likely to have a vaccine, but just that small increment is worth it. Okay. Um, you know, that logic is uh, that the actual calculation is considerably more complicated, but I think the intuition that you want a lot of, of, of uh, to invest in a lot of different vaccines is correct. Now, I do want to emphasize that you know, this, this project is going to look at this issue of vaccine capacity. There are many other critical elements. I don't want to overemphasize this. It's just, uh, uh, you know, as a researcher, we focus on a limited number of, of issues. Uh, um, you obviously don't have that luxury in, in, a, in, a, in a multilateral development bank. You have to think about the whole set of issues. But uh, R&D trials, you know, delivery plans. I know that's an issue the Asian Development Bank is completely appropriately thinking and investing about a lot and investing a lot of energy. Once you have the vaccines, you have to deliver them. That's, uh, I think that's doable, but it's not trivial and requires a lot of thought. Um, you know, there's other, I wrote down diagnostics. I should have written diagnostics drugs. You know, there's other R&D needs. Uh, how do you implement NPIs so that you can get the most benefit from them while limiting the economic costs, you know, the most uh, uh, epidemiological benefit. You know, there are many, many important issues, but we'll focus on the issue of vaccine capacity. Uh, why don't we go on to the next slide? Okay, so uh, gave you a bit of the roadmap. Let me discuss the, um, start out with the issue of procurement. Because the first argument that I've already made in the introduction is that it's worth investing at risk. But the details of procurement, you know, a key lesson from the Pneumococcus Advanced Market Commitment and a lesson that we, we learn in economics all the time is the details of, of contract design matter immensely. And you know, if I have one lesson from what we've done, a, a meta lesson, um, is that you really need to bring in experts in, in contract design obviously legal experts, but also economic experts in contract design. I'm a development economist, um, but you know, some of my colleagues like Susan Athey or Chris Steiner uh, or, or, or uh, Scott uh, uh, all come from a uh, you know, uh, industrial organization, uh, a contract design uh, perspective. So I'll, st I'll do that. Then I'll go through the analysis in a little bit more detail, uh, just the quantitative analysis on whether it's worth investing at risk talk about issues of international equilibrium, international cooperation, uh, supply chains, and, uh, and, and end with a little bit on, on policy implications. And we go to the next slide. Um, okay, uh, one more would be great. Okay, the first principle is that doses are much more valuable if delivered early. That sounds trivial, and that was the point I made in the introduction. But if you think about all sorts of times when we sign contracts and we need something delivered soon, sometimes you don't get it delivered soon. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm just moved. So, you know, we're, I've dealt with real estate, with housing you know, contractors for building a house before. Well, you know, you can sign a contract with a, a, a contractor saying that the, the doses are, mixing my metaphors here, but the house will be finished on uh, you know, November 1st, or the doses will be ready by, by I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you know, our, our president here in the US wanted those doses delivered before the election, for example. Um, how, uh, but how, what do you do? They say, well, we're not ready. Something happened. It turned, the construction turned out to be more complicated than we thought. Um, the, we ran into a technical problem in, we had an adverse event. Our trials had to be paused. It's very 
it's very difficult. You're not going to say, oh, you didn't deliver on time. Forget it. We don't want the vaccine after all. You desperately need that vaccine. You need the house. You're not going to walk away from the contract. So how would you deal with that? Well, you know, one, one possible way, how do you design the contract to avoid that problem? Well, one, one way is to put in a penalty clause to say, well, if you build the house on time, you get an extra payment. If you don't, you forfeit. If you're more than one month late, you pay an extra, you know, $10,000 every day you're late. Then you're in the area of a standard contract design issue, which is a trade-off between incentives and risk bearing. If you imagine we wanted to get the incentives exactly right, well, then we would need to charge the companies $500 billion every month they're late. Well, that imposes huge risk on the companies. No company would accept that risk, or if they did, they would have to charge a huge amount for something that could bankrupt the company, especially because there are legitimate events outside their control that they can't do anything about. You know, we've, some trials have had to be paused because the, 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 they were concerned about adverse events. Um, so, so a approach based on penalty clause will not get you to the first best. One approach that I think can, can be used, uh, you know, we're not gonna get to the first best no matter what we do. This is a matter of, of trade-offs. But one thing to do is to make the contract one in which you specify that the company has to install the manufacturing capacity. If that's what you're trying to accelerate, that's, that's, you should directly incentivize it. That's one of, the, uh, one of the conclusions that came both out of the pneumococcus advanced market commitment work and out of our modeling of this. So one way to structure that is through a contract in which the company is paid to install capacity. And then in exchange, the company gives the right to purchase doses that come from that capacity. So the purchaser could, do, could, could get those doses uh, when, they're, when they're ready. I don't want to claim that's the only way to structure a contract. There, um, there, there are probably multiple ways to structure a contract, but what's key is that you have to create incentives to actually build the capacity. Otherwise, you get the doses, but you know they install a small factory. Then when the, they just give doses in you know two years from now, and the country that buys this is not actually getting uh, getting the advancement of availability that they were seeking. So that's a you know one very basic lesson. Why don't we go on to the next slide? Uh, a basic lesson, but one that is actually, you know, takes a lot of work to think about how to implement. Okay. Another issue is, should you pay a reward only for a successful product, or do you pay, you know, um, even early on, before we know whether the product is successful? So the pneumococcus advanced market commitment, in that case, this, this was structured as a $1.5 billion reward for a successful product. So the company only, only got paid if, they, if their vaccine were, were successful. And I think there are circumstances under which that type of approach uh, makes sense. In the uh, COVID-19 vaccine case, one thing that comes out of the full analysis, and I hinted out in the introduction, is that it makes sense to have many shots on goal. Um, it's optimal to incentivize you know, many different vaccine developers uh, to, to, to invest in a vaccine, even if some of them have a low subjective probability of success. So the example I gave in the introduction, all the, we knew, everybody knew that all the vaccines had a 10% chance of success. Obviously, the real world isn't like that. There are some candidates that are more likely to succeed, others that are less. It's a very subjective judgment. Um, I don't know if this, others are experiencing this, but my screen is looking a bit, uh, isn't, um, the video isn't, isn't great, but I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to continue. Uh, the, um, um, it looks fine to, to us, Michael. Okay. Okay, I may have to look down at my uh, at my notes. I did a printout. I guess that was a good idea. Um, the um, so the the optimal procurement design. This is an asymmetric information problem, and the optimal procurement design is going to depend on the information structure and the ability to differentiate prices uh, between different types of uh, of, uh, of producers. So, if if we think about you. Know, in, in truth, the, the buyer can't, uh, can't observe, you know, doesn't have the full information. They have uncertainty about a lot of variables. 
but one thing I think they probably have, have, have particularly bad information about is the firm's estimate of the probability of success. You know, that's a very subjective thing. Why don't we go into the next slide, actually? Um, maybe, maybe that will come better, be better for me. No. Um, okay. Um, the, um, okay. Um, what, but there's also uncertainty of the cost of capacity installation, but that's probably much more observable. If the firm says it needs a per particular piece of machinery to, for its factory, you know, the cost of that, they can show the invoice for the cost of that, that machinery. Um, you know, maybe they can inflate costs a little bit, but th there are limits to that. Um, where do we go into the next slide? Okay, great. Um, okay, so think about an example. Um, I'll, I'll give an, a, um, an illustrative example. These are, these are, this is an artificial example, but I, in our model, we try to use estimates of, uh, of actual numbers to gauge if these effects are, are important. So there are two ways that, I'm sorry, not combining push and pull funding. Could you go back to the previous slide? Great. Um, so one type of funding, which was what we, was used for the advanced market commitment for pneumococcus, was purely was I mean was pull funding. Uh, pull funding um, that's just for a successful vaccine. The alternative is what's sometimes called push funding, upfront financing um, that that provides um, um, that provides uh, uh, money to cover the costs of the of the factory, for example. So let's take an example where we know that each unit of capacity costs $4 to install. But let's say that the buyer doesn't know the, the chance of success for the producer. And let's say that the chance of, uh, sorry, the word independent shouldn't be up there. Suppose the producer might have a 20%, believe they have a 20% chance of uh, that their vaccine will succeed or 10% or, or maybe they, they're pretty pessimistic and they think there's only a 5%. Well, how much, how much push funding do you need and how much pull funding do you need in order to incentivize the development of the factory, the construction of the factory? Um, well, what I, if, you're, if it's push funding, you just pay for the capacity. Maybe there's a small profit margin. I'm thinking of the, include, the costs including the profit margin. So you put $4. And that would be true in any of these three scenarios. The, the chance of success doesn't affect the cost of building the factory. So you just, it would cost $4 per dose to build this. Now there's, there's another way you can pay. You can say, well, we're only gonna pay you if you're successful. So let's start out in the top row. Imagine that you, that you knew there was a 20% chance of success. Well, to have the firm, if the firm were risk neutral, which it's, it's presumably not, but you know, just as, a, as an exercise, um, if they have a 20% chance of success, then they would need to be paid uh, five times the $4 if they succeed to compensate them for the additional risk. Um, so you'd need to pay them $20. Okay, if you knew that for sure, it's sort of six of one, half dozen of the other. There, there are some differences in if they're risk averse, but basically you pay the same amount in expectation for a successful vaccine. But now suppose that, that, that you don't know the chance of success or you don't know what the company believes the chance of success to be. It might only be, be 10%. Well, if it were 10%, the company would need four, uh, $40 in order to, to justify this investment. Or it might only be 5%, in which case they would need um, $80 uh, for, uh, for a successful vaccine to justify the investment. That puts the buyer in a very difficult situation because this is a case where a 5% chance of success is big enough that it's worth investing in the vaccine. So the company, the, the buyer can say, they could say, well, we're just gonna, we're just gonna offer only, only $20 for success. Well, then that's fine if it turns out that the company uh, believes there's a 20% chance of success. But if it turns out the company doesn't believe that and isn't willing to invest, then you know, maybe you're letting a successful vaccine go by. So you might wind up paying the full $80, but then you're paying much more than you would have needed to had the, if, the, if in these other uh, possible uh, states of the world in which the, the company were more optimistic. So how can you solve that? Well, you can solve that by just paying upfront for, for the, 
before we, you know, this, you know, the, I don't want to claim this is perfect. There are downsides of this as well. But just say, we'll, we'll have our scientific assessment, which won't be perfect, but of which vaccines are worth investing in, and then we'll pay for the factory capacity. So that's, uh, I think that should have a, a, have a fairly large element of any uh, incentive scheme. When we go on to the next slide. Now, look, in practice, you know, the model does suggest that these types of forces are important and that it does make sense to have a big push element. It probably does make sense to have some pull element as well. You want to incentivize speed, you want to incentivize capacity. If there are some manufacturers who know that they really have one in a thousand chance of success, maybe you don't want them to invest and you want to, and you don't want to pay for the factory. So having, having them put some skin in the game probably makes sense. So the, the extreme conclusion that you go with a hundred percent push uh, probably isn't right. Um, okay, why don't we, we move on? Um, okay. So this all gives some sense of, of what the structure of a contract might look like. Structure of a contract probably wants to pay for capacity with substantial upfront uh, payments. Then you can say, if that's the form of the contract, is it worth investing at risk and how much do you want to invest? And that's what we do in the next section of the paper. Okay, um, why don't we skip the next slide? Um, I'll, and I'll move on to one more slide, please. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a hint of, 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 of some of the the detail that goes into the model. We look at the economic harm caused by COVID-19 from World Bank figures. That's typically five to 10% of GDP. That's also true for most of the countries in the, in the, in the, of the member countries of, ADB, of the Asian Development Bank, but um, you know, there's obviously variation. Um, we try to include health benefits, but really the results are driven by the economic benefits. Now we cut all the benefits in half. Why? Because maybe some other treatment or other mitigation strategy will be developed before a vaccine is available. So that's a very crude, but we're trying to be conservative. Um, we, um, okay. Um, I should say, you know, it, it turns out that a large share of the health benefits come from vaccinated healthcare workers and the elderly. So we assume that delivering the first set of doses is the most valuable. Um, and we assume that, that investing early in parallel with testing accelerates vaccine availability by three months. Um, and you're know, happy to share this, as I say, so that you can play around with other assumptions. The, on the supply side, we look at you know, the more than 100 candidates and we use, based on the historical data on chance of success at different stages, based on expert opinion, um, we try to assign probabilities of success. Um, and we also try to take into account the correlation between different vaccine candidates and to some extent the cost. So there are different technological pro approaches with very different costs. Um, so that's obviously part of the optimal economic decision. Why don't we uh, move on? So one thing the analysis brings out and it's gonna drive a lot of our results is that there are high returns, particularly high returns, to the initial candidates and to the, uh, to the initial uh, units of capacity per candidate. So um, if we, why are the high returns to the initial candidates, uh, you know, vaccine candidates? Well, you start with the investment with the strongest candidates, or to be more precise, you start with the candidates that are, are, have a high ratio of probability of success to cost. Then you move on to less desirable candidates as a purchaser. Um, the, pr the probability of success is capped at one. Now that's obviously artificial in some sense in the real world, vaccines could differ in characteristics. There are benefits to having multiple vaccines. So that, um, you know, this is a, a, a rough approximation. But you'll see in this chart, sort of very high returns. It's, it's hard to tell from the chart because it looks like just a normal diminishing returns uh, uh, chart, but these are immense amounts of money that are saved uh, and Im immense numbers of lives from a successful vaccine. So it's very high returns at the beginning and then it flattens out a bit. Okay. Similarly with the number of candidates. Um, so if you look at the back, back uh, the bottom half of uh, the bottom chart, that shows the, the benefits um, um, the, 
um, the months to vaccinate um, through adding capacity. And you'll see that as you initially add capacity, you really have, uh, um, you really save a lot of months into, of time before you can vaccinate the population. But adding additional capacity, that starts to flatten out. You know, why is that? Partly because the first units go to the high-risk population, but, but really it's when you double capacity, you double the cost, but you only cut the time to vaccinate in half. If you have twice as much capacity, it takes half as long to vaccinate. If you double again, you have to again double the cost, but you're only cutting that, that time by half, but it was already smaller, so the absolute gain is smaller. Okay. So these very high returns at the beginning, it turns out, when we go into the next slide, what that implies is that all countries, this isn't just something that high income countries could do. Yes, the US and UK were some of the first to invest in a lot of vaccines, but it actually makes sense for even low income countries to invest in at least some vaccines and at least some capacity. Um, so under some assumptions that we, we put here, um, and again, this is uh, somewhat just meant to be an illustrative example. Um, the, you know, if you look at, compare the low income countries and the middle income countries, these roughly correspond to the World Bank uh, uh, cutoffs. Um, the, um, the, if you think about just buying one candidate, well, the cost, and this is just for 20% of the population. So very, very, you know, a, a very basic purchase. That, has that costs a billion dollars for the low income countries, but it has $5 billion in benefits. So they clearly want to do it. For middle income countries, um, the benefit cost ratio is even greater. It's 22 to one. Okay, now if you expand out to three candidates, well, it's still worth it for the low income country in this, uh, in this you know, run of our model. Um, they get they get an additional $5 billion of benefits. It costs them an additional 4 billion benefit cost ratio of one point, marginal benefit cost ratio of 1.25. Um, yeah. um, but you can see that that's just sort of, that's sort of a marginal investment for them. Um, they won't go out much further than that. So I order a few candidates, but not a very large number. On the other hand, for the uh, middle income countries, you know, it's a very, very high return investment to go out to additional candidates. So, and if we extended this and showed the high income countries, they would actually order a lot of candidates. So the, you know, what are the, this is just a, a, you know, one example of something that comes out. Why don't we go on to the next slide? Uh, next slide. Um, you know, what are the implications for optimal inv investment? Well, all countries would invest at risk. And let me emphasize, you know, <laughs> Obviously, for humanitarian reasons, for equity reasons, it makes sense to get all countries uh, access to a vaccine. I'm not even factoring those in. <laughs> this is true if they, if they just said, well, we're looking at the economic benefits, we're valuing, you know, we put, we look at just the economic benefits and we are spending our own money. It would still be worth it. Um, um, now, of course, the higher income countries would invest more in more candidates and more capacity. Now that has one very important implication, which I'll come back to for international cooperation, which is the optimal program, as we've seen with the US and UK, you know, the optimal thing for a high income country is to invest in, a, take a lot of shots on goal and to put in a lot of capacity for each one. If you're a middle income country, you, you know, Latin America, or that's been hard hit, or uh, probably some of the middle income countries in Asia, which maybe haven't seen as many deaths, but are paying big economic prices. You still invest a fair amount, but not quite as much. Lower income, you'll invest a bit less. That means that the optimal, because the optimal investment program differs for countries, you know, if we had, if everybody was completely international minded, we put and completely focused on, you know, equity and health, then countries would spend $100 billion that would be contributed to an international effort to develop a vaccine. That would be great. But unfortunately, we haven't seen that. You know, what we've seen so far is countries, what's often called vaccine nationalism, you know, countries are going out and doing purchases for themselves. Now, they're purchasing all over the world. It's not the extreme, what, what our model suggests would be extremely costly is if countries only invested in domestically produced vaccines. That would be a complete disaster. 
uh, because you want lots of shots on goal. And you won't get, even a country the size of the US with many vaccine manufacturers, uh, they won't get a full set of shots on goal if they only invest in their own, in their own production. Um, but so countries are purchasing vaccines from abroad. Uh, the US is buying the UK AstraZeneca vaccine, for example. Um, but they're, they're not, at this point, all putting their money into one common pool and then saying, well, we'll allocate the vaccines in, in proportion to population or in proportion to need uh, afterwards. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is from the high income country point of view, you know, we know there are many, many lives at stake, but there's also, you know, 5% five, 5 of GDP at stake. And if you think about the amount that countries spend on international development assistance or cooperation, you know, in, in the, certainly in the case of the U.S., um, um, you know, we're talking 0.2% uh, of GDP, not 5% of GDP. I, I just think it's, it's um, um, if you, it's going to be, I, you know, unfortunately, it's going to be hard to get countries to contribute fully. On the other hand, countries might be willing to put money in. Our analysis suggests it would be worth putting money in if they can get, uh, if, they, if they can have some flexibility in how much they put in and how much they get out. Um, so if they, can, if they can do a self-pay approach. So for example, so COVAX has adopted an approach where for the poorest countries, it will be financed by donations. For the middle income countries and up, they will be paying for their, for their own vaccines, the self-pay component. And I think um, that's more likely to be uh, what, you know, what, what's technically called incentive compatible to make it worth the while for the middle income and higher income countries to pay and to get them to cooperate. You know, I, it would be nice if they would cooperate uh, without that, but that's probably going to be needed to get them to cooperate. But the analysis suggests that because the different, uh, different income levels uh, will want to different numbers of vaccines. And you'll, you'll have to give them some flexibility in how much they order. They can't, can't be a one size fits all, even for the, uh, for the South Bay countries. So why don't we skip the next slide and go into the one after that? Okay. Okay, so we have talked a little bit about, you know, optimal purchases. And I gave these, the prices I assumed were prices that countries are currently uh, paying. But I'll tell you one feature of this. <laughs> one feature of this is that if you look at the optimal amount for each country to invest, it's a lot. And it seems quite possible that the, we'll run out of capacity at some point. So if you looked at this, um, and so that this might not add up, it might not be possible for all countries to purchase the optimal amount at current prices. Um, and many people believe that the, the supply in the short run will be quite inelastic. It takes a lot of time to build capacity. So we'll model the short run supply as relatively inelastic after some kink point. So maybe if you could go on to the next slide. Just think of a simple supply demand diagram. Um, under standard economic analysis, the price is equal to the marginal cost, where price equals, uh, um, um, uh, where supply and demand cross, um, that, will, that will give you the equilibrium. Now, if the, if the supply curve is very inelastic, that will be a high price. What will be the implications of the high price? Why don't we go on to the next slide? Well, it, it implies that there'll be you know, very high profits for those companies that have existing supply capacity. And because the price will just be bid up very high. And that high price might also mean that the low income countries have trouble uh, finding uh, being able to buy. They get priced out of the market. Um, and that's obviously a scenario that many people are concerned about. Now, so far, what is in some ways very surprising is, you know, these initial doses, so some of these initial deals were at very modest prices, things like three or $4 per dose. So that doesn't seem to be happening yet. What's, what's the reason? Why don't we go on to the next slide? Um, you know, one hypothesis is that uh, maybe the supply curve isn't as inelastic as many experts in the industry believe it is. Well, then the price, the equilibrium price would be lower. Um, and indeed, the model really suggests the critical role of increasing capacity. 
That's, that's not just important for any one country to get vaccine in time. That's important for the global equilibrium to avoid uh, prices shooting through the roof. And, um, or to put it another way, it's important for the global, global equilibrium so we can deliver it to the whole world uh, within a reasonable time. Okay. But there's another possibility of what's going on. Because these pricing may be subject to ethical constraints or political constraints. Companies may know if they make very high profits, if they charge much more than, than cost, um, uh, cost plus some regional part, profit margin, that they'll come under uh, pressure from, from governments, um, our regulators. So the other possibility is that, um, that, that companies are pricing at, at close to their actual cost. And that what that would mean is um, that we may be working our way up the supply curve, that it might be possible to get deals now at these low prices, but that eventually the capacity will run out and we'll have to turn to much more expensive sources of capacity, like repurposing capacity away from other needed pr products. Um, well, at that stage, you know, prices would really jump and that would mean that there'd be a race among buyers to lock in low prior, uh, prices. You know, so far, we have seen more and more countries buying, but we haven't yet seen this jump in prices. But, and, and uh, you know, we don't know what the reason why prices have, stay, have been relatively modest so far is. But this is just one other reason why countries might want to buy now, because it could be that uh, there is such a race, and then the prices are going to get much higher. I sound a little bit like a used car salesman. I, I don't own any stock in vaccine companies, but I, uh, uh, you know, I do think this may be a case where if you want to get a good price, you should, you should move now to lock in that price. Okay. Now, here's another issue that I think is worth thinking about, where I think, um, I think there's a point to a lot of the popular discussion, but I think it may also be missing an element. Why don't we go on to the next slide? You know, what's the impact on one country? If one country buys, what's the impact on other countries? Okay. If you look at the, the um, why don't we go into uh, one more slide, I think. Okay, if you buy capacity, that does create some negative short run externalities on other buyers. You know, because you might be driving, buying up, you might be driving up prices or, or um, and by using the, the relatively inexpensive supply, leaving the next country with higher price supply. That's the, fo that's the side that most people have focused on. And I think that is important, particularly in the short run. But if you structure that, again, we're going to come back to the importance of structuring the contract to increase capacity. If you structure the contract to increase capacity, then that extra capacity is there and that's able eventually to start serving other countries. Um, and so in the long run, you're moving out supply and that actually generates a positive externality for other buyers. So, you know, was it a good thing or a bad thing for the rest of the world that the U.S. in Operation Warp Speed invested, said we want 300 million doses of capacity for many different vaccines? Well, you know, I think there are effects in both directions. You know, one effect is, well, they're using up the capacity. The other is, you know, let's say that all the, they've got, you know, six different candidates are successful. Well, then the U.S. will have a lot of extra vaccine and it'll be able to, you know, it won't be won't be able to use it all and uh, the rest of the world will benefit. And if they've gotten more capacity installed, that's actually good for the rest of the world. I, I don't know which way it nets out, but there are effects in both directions. Um, okay. The, um, you know, what are the, what are the implications of all this, the policy implications? Why don't we go on to the next slide? Um, I think if you're a national policymaker or even a regional development bank, yeah, I think the implication is very clear. You should buy now at the current price. It's a, if you advance the availability by even a small amount, it's worth it to your economy. If you, um, and that would be true for a region as a whole. Um, you know, the, a region, uh, any single region would see it the same way. From a global perspective, let's break it down. If you support low and middle income countries to vaccinate uh, the priority populations early, let's say the health workers, the key workers, you know, the, um, the vulnerable populations. Um, that's going to be a gain for the world. Um, it'll be a health gain for the world. Um, and it's a gain for the country. It's got to be optimal for the world as well. 
Now, there are trade-offs if you go beyond that. Um, you know, it, depending on the elasticities, depending on the time perspective, this could, it'll definitely be good for the country that gets the additional doses. Will it be good for the world? Well, maybe you have to, you, if you're thinking about are there negative externalities in other countries, you know, maybe at some point you, you, you do worry about that. That's a moral judgment sort of above my pay grade, uh, whether to look at this, you know, you think that your responsibility is to your client countries or you're thinking uh, uh, more broadly. We, you know, what, is, what would be the implications for the Asian Development Bank? Well, one is, uh, I, I think, um, you know, I've argued that this is a good investment for the countries. If the countries may be running into financial problems right now with all of the economic pressures that are going on. So providing finance is, is uh, at least for the high priority populations is, uh, is I think, a, you know, in my view, a pretty clear implication. Um, possibly going beyond that to cover, uh, to get enough capacity for the rest of the population as well in the short run. Um, but certainly structuring the contracts or working with partners to make sure the contracts are structured to expand capacity is important. Um, let me mention one other issue. Oh, and, well, so actually still on this slide, let me just say, you know, we don't really take a stand on how that's structured. This could be done through COVAX. Um, this could be done through just loans to countries and then the countries decide where they want to purchase. You know, one, as I understand the World Bank uh, proposal, they, and I, I, I'm not an expert on this, I could be wrong, but my understanding of that proposal is the, this would be a loan to a country, it's the same as for procuring anything else, a highway, a railroad, a port, and then the country can, can then decide, do we want to purchase through COVAX or do we want to purchase straight from the company? I think that's a reasonable way to do it. And then the companies, uh, um, uh, you know, then the, then the countries can get what they need. Now, let me turn to one, one final issue. And, you know, this is a, something that we've been just thinking about recently. But um, uh, one more slide. Um, I'm sorry, it's in one final issue, two, a couple of issues. Um, one is exchange mechanisms. Um, you know, different vaccines have different characteristics. We've mostly abstracted from that. But some vaccines are going to be easier to deliver than others. Some of them might be one dose, might, some might be multiple doses. Some vaccines might be available earlier. Some vaccines might be 50% effective. Others might be 80% effective. In any single country, you do, countries may have different preferences of what they need, depending on their, their delivery infrastructure, uh, depending on your know, cold chain capacity, et cetera, depending on whether they're having an outbreak at the particular moment and they want say, look, we really want doses now. We don't want doses in three months. Um, if countries put different weights on these characteristics, then having some ability to exchange probably makes sense. And I think that also uh, would make it, um, my sense is that would make a mechanism like COVAX work better if they could, if they have some uh, ability for, uh, for exchange. Okay. Um, and we've been, uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go through the slide in full detail, but we've been thinking about the design of that uh, with some experts on the design of, uh, of that type of mechanism. Um, okay. I'm, I'll, I'll briefly mention uh, supply chains. Um, we've been thinking, if you go on to the next slide, um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, and one more please. Um, there's, um, you know, if firms don't have the ability to raise their prices, you could easily get stuck in a situation. Let me give you a, a hypothetical example. Suppose that, um, suppose that to increase the supply of vaccines, we need more bioreactors or we need more uh, um, glass vials. or more adjuvants. If we're trying to immunize the whole world quickly, we need a huge supply of that. We may need to expand the factory capacity for bioreactors or for adjuvants. If you're, thinking, if you're a producer of an input and you're thinking that you face a temporary increase in capacity that might not last a long time, it might just be a couple of years, do you want to build a factory with, with a huge capacity that's going to last 20 years if you know it's going to, that there's a risk it's going to be idle? Well, that's a tough decision to make. To make that decision, you may need a very high price. 
But if there are political constraints on pricing, you may not want to build that factory at all. So one of the analysis is that there's a case for, just as there's a case for building support for, uh, for investing in vaccine capacity, there's a case for investing capacity for the, uh, for the whole supply chain. And I think because a lot of the supply chain is in Asia, you know, I think that's, uh, I focus so much on the, the purchase side of this, but if we think about the supply side, um, you know, there's, I think the Asian Development Bank can, can potentially contribute in that way as well by making loans, not just sovereign loans to purchase vaccines, but loans to, uh, to firms to increase production capacity, both for vaccines and for the, uh, for the supply chain capacity. Okay, when I move on to the conclusion slides, I apologize for going over. Um, I think the optimal incentives include a large push component with uh, upfront payments for installation in exchange for the option to purchase the vaccine. You know, it doesn't have to be done that way. That's probably the most efficient way to do it. Uh, the main thing is just to make sure we invest and invest in a way that's actually going to accelerate the capacity installation. Um, the optimal number of, of vaccine candidates and capacity um, probably differs among countries. So building in some flexibility into whatever the system is makes sense. I think the COVAX uh, self-pay program does some of that, probably could go a, a bit further. Um, allowing exchange mechanisms could probably be valuable um, and it's worth investing in supply chains. I think uh, on the final slide, I think the Asian Development Bank can, you know, contribute and uh, could be a major contributor to this, both by lending for countries to buy vaccines. And I think this is a fairly normal transaction, uh, just a lending to buy a product. Um, the, I think it's, you know, clearly to lend uh, to buy at least for 20% of the population, probably for, for more, but, you know, that is a judgment call. Um, and then also to make loans for, for supply chain capacity. I do think that it's a very tricky business to get the contract right. Um, and um, otherwise, if you just buy doses, um, but you don't specify when those are gonna come, then you may just get the doses at the back of the queue and then get the supply you know, two years later when you would have gotten them anyway. Um, and you know, that's, that's the situation to avoid. Um, so um, there's also ways that you can design the contract so that you're, you're getting as much value for money as possible by avoiding having a lot of rents go to the inframarginal firms. Um, um, and that probably involves paying for capacity rather than just for a successful vaccine. Great, thanks very much. And uh, be very happy to, to hear what others have to say and to, um, and to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kramer. Uh, your remarks today are not only timely, but very relevant and helpful to us. So uh, thank you very much. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have assembled a panel of ADB colleagues uh, who we've uh, invited today to give their thoughts on the issues that you have raised today. So first of all, I want to turn to ADB's chief economist, uh, Yasu, um, as an economist, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts and comments today? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kremer, for your uh, extremely timely and important presentation. Uh, in the ADB is a distinct speaker program. Usually, we have an authoritative presentation midterm or long-term uh, development issues. But today's lecture was quite unusual in the sense that uh, talk provi provides a very concrete, pragmatic solutions and guidance and the guiding principle uh, to uh, ongoing uh, burning issue, which is relevant for everyone uh, around the globe. And I, also I found the power of economic theory and e empirical numerical analysis in providing such a pragmatic uh, solutions. Uh, potential role, for example, potential role production capacity to keep uh, price low, accessible to low income countries, and also potential uh, to facilitate the uh, production of uh, uh, vaccines by uh, uh, Asian um, uh, farms, 
uh, uh, companies in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, or even uh, Bangladesh. I think uh, there are lots of implications for uh, ADB uh, uh, operations uh, and also uh, supporting uh, global society. Uh, uh, since uh, DG Wu Chong Um uh, coming up next, and also DG Dia Guitarist uh, would be commenting on vaccines health issues, as well as ADB's operation program, ADB's role. I'd like to make uh, only one comment about the bit broader resource allocation issue in order to contain the pandemic so that we can con con contextualize uh, uh, today's uh, wonderful presentation by uh, Professor Kremer. Uh, it has been clear uh, 5 billion US dollars uh, uh, per month, that's a cost. Uh, in other words, uh, 17 billion US dollars per day. So postponing uh, development um, uh, globally, we encounter 17 billion US dollars uh, cost every day. Uh, so I think uh, uh, vaccine development should be definitely top listed. But at the same time, uh, we also need to get uh, prepared for the worst case scenario. Uh, there is a chance COVID um, uh, to be like uh, a pneumococcal uh, disease and the vaccine can be found soon after. But uh, also considering the um, uh, uh, difficulty of vaccine development for uh, other diseases like malaria, uh, it may take uh, three years, five years, or even 10 years until we get and roll out uh, effective uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So then uh, what shall we do? So that's my uh, question comment. Uh, uh, while waiting for vaccines, uh, also we need to elaborate on the model of non-pharmaceutical interventions plus effective uh, treatment like uh, uh, malaria. Uh, malaria, you know, for prevention, we have a long-lasting insect diet treated net and also uh, uh, rapid diagnosis test and ACT drug treatment. So in that sense, uh, we also need to devote uh, some resources uh, to figure out effective uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention as well as uh, effective treatment, in addition to definitely important uh, uh, prevention by uh, finding uh, new vaccines. And uh, like uh, having uh, many vaccine candidates, uh, it's um, uh, really a good idea. I think uh, uh, we also uh, probably need to consider how to make a lockdown smart using a digital based uh, test trace isolation, such as the ones uh, done in uh, uh, Korea, uh, as well as a very effective uh, PPEs, maybe digital based uh, smart masks and uh, smart face shields. These things uh, we can also devote some resources. And um, uh, in fact, uh, our um, recent uh, cross-country comparison study at ADB uh, indicates an important role of uh, incentives, um, uh, which is uh, quite similar uh, to um, uh, uh, Professor Kremer's presentation. Almost all containment measures, among the uh, different types of containment measures, uh, we found, according to our study, uh, contract Facing when combined with a paid sick leave so that the incentivize um, uh, people to stay, sick people or affected uh, you know, uh, people uh, stay at home has the largest contribution uh, in reducing uh, uh, COVID-19 spread so far. So this is uh, our study. So in sum, um, uh, my comment is I think it's critical to set out a broader strategy to contain a pandemic and also to reopen the economy, including a today's a topic of uh, developing and delivering a new vaccines, combining together with effective uh, treatments and non-pharmaceutical inter interventions while waiting for vaccines. Uh, admittedly, my comment is uh, beyond the scope of a very focused, concrete, and a wonderful presentation by Professor Kremer. But again, I wanted to make this comment uh, to contextualize a wonderful presentation of uh, Professor uh, Kremer. But in any case, uh, uh, vaccine development should be top listed, but also uh, 17 uh, billion US dollars uh, we are uh, gonna encounter I think uh, some effort can be made to reduce a uh, 17 billion uh, cost daily down to a uh, uh, 10 billion or even uh, 5 billion per day. So I, I thought that this uh, broader uh, perspective is also uh, complementary to uh, uh, today's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Yasu, for those, uh, those uh, thoughtful remarks. Now I'm going to invite Director General Wu Chong Um, who heads our Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, which houses our health sector group. So Wu Chong, what is the thinking of our health sector expert when it comes to the issues that we've been hearing about today? Um, yes, thank you very much. First of all, great appreciation to Professor Kramer for getting up so early in the morning over there to give us this excellent, insightful, and timely presentation. And I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Sawada that this is actually right in the, in the, we're in the middle of uh, discussing this issue with the management and the board on how to proceed. 
and there's so many things in the presentation that that resonated and you know even this one statement about 1.5 a 1.2 billion dollar investment being worthwhile even if you can accelerate uh, discovery uh, by 10 hours that's that's quite a quite a uh, um, amazing thought and and we completely agree that we need to move this quite quickly um so as you can imagine, you know, 2020 has been all about containing COVID-19 pandemic for many of us in ADB. And um, and this year, and early this year, when this thing broke out, the ADB had been focusing on providing urgent support to the developing countries to flatten the curve uh, with over $100 million um, to procure um, the the personal protective equipment and um, emergency and medical supplies. And then $20 billion emergency loan package to help developing countries to deal with the adverse economic and social issues. So as you can imagine, now we are looking at how to get the economies back on track and effective and safe vaccine will certainly serve as a critical tool to reduce the prevalence and will allow the countries to safely reopen and, and get back to business. Um, so in doing this, um, you know, obviously the non-pharmaceutical interventions are also quite important. Um, such as the physical distancing and wearing masks. And in the Philippines, we have to also wear um, uh, face shield as well. Uh, but vaccine actually is very, very important uh, tool for us to be able to control transmission in combination with the non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we completely agree. And given the scale of the virus um, the transmission, the demand for to achieve herd immunity is estimated to be over 15 billion doses by 2023. So we have a lot of a lot of work to do, but fortunately, as as you said, there are many players um, in this vaccine game trying to take shots, um, and we need to make sure that the right people take the right kind of shots. So um, I need to talk. The, my my main focus of my discussion is about what is the role of the MDB and where we can make the biggest difference. And and I believe the MDBs, multilateral development banks like ADB. Uh, do not have the comparative advantage to take the lead in developing and testing and validating uh, vaccines. So we have to work very closely, in which we are doing that uh, with uh, WH and others, so that we can learn from them and, and advise the developing countries on what's the latest um, issue on this um, that they need to be aware of. And also there's you know, many global initiatives such as um, you know, COVAX, which we are also engaged with so that the you know, poor countries can um, provide the financing as well and and this advanced market commitment is a great mechanism to give incentive for faster development so at the asian development bank um, we are looking at the vaccine uh, from the holistic perspective and we are basically looking at how to get the vaccines from the labs to the arms of the poor people and there are a few things that we're looking at um, you know, there's a safety issue. So there has to be a, a proper demand and there's, there, there's a perceived, the risk, um, perceived risk of taking COVID-19 vaccine because of the speed in which it's being developed. So we have to closely monitor the development and, and, and safety and communicate this properly to all population in, in our region. Logistics is a big thing. And this is something that we, I think we can play a big role um, because in some, due to the geographical landscape, in some countries, delivering vaccines at scale could be as costly or even more than the vaccine itself. The cold chain, you know, some candidate vaccines require extreme cold, like minus uh, 70 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, so some of these vaccines may not be even viable for some of the countries that we are dealing with. So we have to advise our countries on that and help out. And uh, delivery systems, you know, most immunization systems are geared towards reaching children. And for this one, we have to get to the adults and elderly. So we need a whole new system and there's a quite a bit of capacity building uh, needed. And finally, um, the, you know, most of these countries will have more than one vaccine in the market at once. So the information system to monitor how, to, how many doses people have received and uh, which products is causing which kind of uh, adverse impacts is very essential. So. Um, the final part of my comment is that, what, so what can ADB do? Um, a lot of knowledge management we have to do. We are already working with WHO, CDC, CEPI, Gavi, COVAX, and very importantly, coordinating with the multilateral development banks uh, like, the, like the World Bank. We have to work together and advise um, um, our, our client countries. And we have to do a lot of capacity building to the developing countries so that even before the vaccine is available, we have to get them ready uh, to be able to access it when, when the vaccines roll off the, the labs. So for example, some of the 
we need a lot of country coordination within the country as, as well as inter-country um, in the whole region as well as, well as the sub-region. The countries need to have a vaccine prioritization and planning strategy, so we need to provide support in doing so. Uh, we also need to help them prepare for vaccine delivery system in coordination with the technical agencies such as the UNICEF. Uh, we also need to do quantification and demand forecasting of COVID-19 vaccine needs for the country and, and the region as well. And as Professor um, mentioned that financing is very important. Obviously, we are a bank, so we need to provide financing to both the public sector governments as well as the private sector um, to be able to access this. And, and I totally agree that the supply chains is where our private sector arm can be quite active um, in getting the, the proper capacity up and running. So let me close my comment by saying, um, you know, when ADB was established in 1966, our first president said ADB must be like a family doctor who knows the, the needs of the patient. Uh, but this time we will be fi family doctor, but with a general hospital capability by working with everyone else. Uh, like yourself uh, so that we can provide the comprehensive support to the needs of the developing countries. So let me stop there. Thanks very much Wu Chong and uh, reminding us of uh, the family doctor uh, and uh, 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 history. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to Director General Leia Gutierrez who heads our Pacific Department. Uh, Leia, uh, you are leading our, the support to some of the bank's most vulnerable countries. What are your reflections on what you've heard today? Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Stokes. And uh, I'd like to thank Professor Kramer for the timely and excellent presentation uh, today. Thank you. Um, uh, for today, uh, first, I would like to give an overview of the impact of the pandemic in the Pacific. Uh, the needs in the Pacific and ADB's assistance. So where uh, Director General Um has described uh, what uh, the approach of ADB, uh, a larger overview, this, uh, what I'm going to talk about, will be zeroing in uh, on the specifics of what we're doing on the ground. Uh, first of all, uh, just a background on the Pacific. Uh, the COVID-19 has caused uh, the Pacific region's uh, most significant economic shock to date. Um, the Pacific countries closed their borders in a very timely manner, such that to date, only two of the 14 uh, member countries we have in the Pacific have had positive cases. Um, and most of our 14 uh, member countries there are actually grant receiving countries. Now, uh, the closed borders, of course, uh, the impact have been uh, reduced tourism, reduced uh, remittance flows, and, and also reduce trade. And uh, this has basically negatively impacted uh, all of the economies and has contributed to increasing poverty. And of course, with increased poverty, uh, this has caused uh, greater vulnerability of uh, the poor and marginalized groups, particularly women. And the most impacted economies in the region are of course, uh, the tourism dependent economies. Now, um, so we're, what we are uh, uh, with this pandemic, uh, we're expecting that poverty levels could in fact return to that uh, level of a decade ago in some of the countries that we work in. Now, um, the Pacific countries are at a high risk of importing COVID-19. And an outbreak would overwhelm uh, the health systems. Uh, there's a very limited number of doctors, nurses, very limited number of hospital beds, ventilators, and testing facilities, among others. For the WHO, uh, the large majority of the Pacific countries are classified as level two in terms of preparedness and response capacity to COVID-19, with level five being the best. Um, in addition, some of our Pacific DMCs also have high rates of obesity and diabetes, which will increase COVID morbidity and mortality should the populations become exposed to COVID-19. Now, for economic recovery, open borders are a prerequisite. And as borders reopen, the risks uh, for importing COVID-19 also increase 
also increase exponentially and um, morbidity impacts will threaten to overwhelm the health services. So to prepare for, uh, for reopening, the health systems must be ready to respond to possible COVID-19 infection. And COVID-19 has shown that health investments require a higher priority. We need to strengthen the primary health care systems and build institutional capacities in the Pacific countries. We need to enhance surveillance and the monitoring of disease. And uh, as the focus of our today's presentation, um, one of the most important uh, potential investment to, pre to prevent COVID-19 from burdening health systems will be a COVID-19 vaccine. And in this regard, we need to strengthen the regional health, not just the country health systems, but the regional health systems for an effective rollout of a potential COVID-19 vaccine. This includes storage, cold chain facilities, better targeting, and raising awareness. We also need better monitoring and data collection systems, updates of policies, and training of health workers. And lastly, we need to fight vaccine hesitancy. Now, um, in the Pacific, uh, I would like to share that collaboration in the health sector among development partners is strong. There is a concerted effort to coordinate assistance in each country and across the region. UN agencies, including the WHO and UNICEF, bilateral agencies uh, from partners like Australia and New Zealand, and the World Bank and the ADB are in frequent contact and meet regularly. Partners are working together to ensure that the Pacific region has timely access to a vaccine by engaging with global vaccine alliances and ensuring that Pacific needs are taken into consideration when planning vaccine supplies. Um, so my colleague uh, DG Um has uh, provided an overview of what ADB is doing. doing. So now I would like to highlight ADB's assistance in the Pacific in the area of health. So we have supported strengthening health systems, including through reforms in public financial management to ensure that the sector is appropriately financed and can use the funding efficiently. We have also provided uh, budget support to ensure financing is available for, crit for critical response areas such as health. We also have a regional vaccine project covering four countries, namely Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. Through this project, we are pulling the procurement of selected vaccines and cold chain equipment, strengthening immunization systems, and investing in community engagement on vaccines and public health. Moving forward, we stand ready to expand this project to include COVID-19 vaccines when approved for safety and effectiveness. And this includes further expanding cold chain and supply chain capacities, strengthening surveillance systems to report on any adverse events. And we would be complement complementing this with increased communication to better engage communities and, in and integrate COVID-19 vaccines in the immuniz immunization program, in addition to current health promotion activities. The use of a regional procurement uh, platform in this project can be a model for facilitating the access of all Pacific countries to a vaccine. Um, in addition, we are investing in water and sanitation projects as part of infection control and waste management to help countries safely dispose of used medical supplies. Um, in conclusion, I would say that the COVID pandemic has demonstrated for us uh, working in the Pacific, the need to work collaboratively, share knowledge, pull resources together, and work across sectors to deliver solutions to our client countries, both in the immediate and in the long term. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leia. Um, now, uh, we've been having so much fun. Uh, I'm worried that we've uh, squeezed the amount of time we have for questions. So I'm going to quickly go to Vice President uh, Bambang Susantono uh, for the first question. So uh, Bambang. 
Thank you, Debra, and also thanks for wonderfully moderating these sessions. Uh, Professor Kramer, thank you and my appreciations for your very insightful presentations. Some people say that the current crisis calls for a paradigm shift in public and global health policies and in the uh, nexus between local, national, and global health policies and system. They argue that it is necessary to adopt a more holistic approach to health, reflecting both a security approach and a health development approach, tackling upstream causes and determinants aimed at helping population reduce their individual risk factors and also augment their natural immunity. Such preventive health policy must be tailored to local specificities and local environments, and health system must be strengthened at the local level so as to be able to respond to population needs and expectations. So my question is, uh, first question is, uh, do you think that there will be a paradigm shift after COVID-19 in the global health governance? And if I may also, I would like to have a, a second question. Uh, given the situation you presented and also countries' nationalism to get the vaccines, what are, what are the uh, likely uh, scenarios happening next year? 20, in the 2021 for the COVID-19 vaccines to be uh, distributed equitably among countries, within countries, and to the poorest. Thank you. So, Professor Kramer, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, oh, the, um, you know, just to respond to, to some of the earlier comments, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much in agreement with the, the, the points that were made by uh, by, uh, by Chief Economist Sawada and, and about the importance of, of, uh, of NPI and thinking about we, we may have a vaccine and it's worth, it's definitely worth investing in it, but we need many, many shots on goal. And some of those are vaccines, some of those are improved drugs, improved diagnostics, improved systems for NPIs. Um, um, and in fact, the same arguments, the, the same basic argument about why we need lots of shots on goal for vaccines apply to all of those others as well. Um, I, I, you know, I also agree with the emphasis on health delivery, that, uh, of delivery of the vaccines. That's, not a, that's a very important problem. And, and many of, you know, really the, all of the points that have been made. Um, uh, to come to this particular question, you know, I think we, we clearly need uh, to recognize most obviously the danger of pandemics, which the world was really unprepared for. I think we need to make sure that we have um, systems in place so that you know, we, if we do have pandemics, we've got the basic supplies available. That includes most obviously PPE, which would apply to be needed for a variety of types of, of, uh, of, of epidemics. We can't predict exactly what the next epidemic will be. Uh, we need, um, we, need uh, uh, we want to make sure that we've got the bioreactors in place. We've got the, the delivery systems like glass vials or other, other technologies available. So that if we do need to ramp up production of, of vaccines for some future pandemic, uh, we're able to do so. So I, I certainly hope that there will be a paradigm shift. And, you know, really, we need to be thinking more, much more broadly, even than just pandemics. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, one of the things that I think has been, been made clear is that, uh, and that I think historians have always been aware of, you know, it's very easy to think we've seen progress, we've seen a uh, progress against poverty. We've seen progress in, in other dimensions, but you know, the world is subject to what economists call tail risks. Um, there's just some extreme events and the next event may be very different, um, but we need to prepare for some of these extreme events. And uh, you know, climate change is, is obviously another one where um, you know, we could have, there's a tail risk that could be very severe and we need to uh, we need to start planning for that and, and putting contingency plans in, in place now. As far as global cooperation, you know, I think one thing that, I think global cooperation would be wonderful um, and I will get some of it. I think I'm not particularly optimistic about getting as much of it as uh, some might desire, but I do think one thing that is a very basic step that actually can be, I think we need to design international cooperation in a way that recognizes the, the imperatives that politicians face. You know, whether we're talking about a, a, a explicitly nationalist politician or whether we're talking about a you know, ordinary politician, um, all of them are accountable to their voters uh, and to their citizens. 
and they're all going to, and we need to design systems so that they can they can act in ways that are consistent with global needs while also fulfilling their responsibilities to their citizens. Um, and that in that in the case of this particular case, I think allowing uh, countries to put in orders flexibly. So they don't all have to order the exact same package, but different countries can say, well, we, you know, we can't afford the most expensive vaccines that require very, are very going to be very difficult to deliver. We're going to put our resources into other vaccines, or we're going to set up a way uh, so that ex post we can have exchange and we can trade more of one type of vaccine. Um, you know, maybe we want more of a certain type of vaccine and less of another. We can do those trades. So setting things up, setting up systems flexibly to incentivize the national cooperation is going to be key. Uh, I guess the final thing I would say on this issue is, you know, really a lot can be done with trade. And what's very sad is when we don't even see that basic being done. Uh, you know, let me give the example of my own country, the U.S. and of China. You know, both countries have a lot of vaccine, a lot of need for vaccine. Um, and they have a lot of vaccine production capacity. Now, it so turns out that we're investing in the capacity is for different types of vaccines. You know, China is doing some live attenuated vaccines. Those are, have some advantages, some technological advantages. They are, they're not reliant on, a, on the, 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 let me contrast them to what the US, US is doing some very technologically advanced ones. Um, but there, it's very dependent on the spike protein. So they're, they're trying to get the, the, um, the, the antibodies to react to that. If you have the whole vaccine, the whole uh, live attenuated uh, organism there, then there are many possible uh, uh, sites that could react to. But on the other hand, there might be sa some safety issues. So if you have different platforms being pursued, one platform might succeed, the other one might not. China should be prepared to say, if there's a safety issue with their vaccine, they're going to want the U.S. vaccine. The U.S., if our vaccines don't work and if the Chinese vaccines turn out to be safe, we should want that. There's no reason that we couldn't just, uh, you know, no technological reason, there may be political reasons, there's no technological reason that we couldn't each try to be very transparent about our testing um, so that anybody could buy either vaccine if it turns out to work. And so that we could, we could then, just like we're making orders for UK vaccines, we could be making orders for, for China's vaccines. And Chinese, China could say, we're going to put in some orders for UK vaccines and US vaccines. I, I would say, you know, that's a, just, that doesn't require any politician to do anything outside the interest of their population. That just requires them to, to say, let's take advantage of opportunities for trade. You know, the oldest lesson of economics, but, uh, but still a good one. Uh, well said. Um, so uh, we now have an opportunity for a few questions. So we have a question that's been posed by Veronique, but it's been supported by uh, lots of people in the audience. And so the question is, uh, Professor Kramer, what about the scope for governments and multilateral development banks like ADB, like the World Bank, to join public-private partnerships in R&D and manufacturing? Uh, so I think there's um, let me I think there's a real distinction between the two, and this talk really focused on manufacturing. In a way, that's the easier problem because investing in manufacturing is the interest of every country to make sure that they have. That, that doesn't mean investing at home, but putting in the order so that somebody can build the capacity that can be used for for the needs of that country. That's every country's national interest. The R and D is a global public good. Now, we get some of that because countries support it, but we probably have less than we need. And, you know, as, as we heard from Chief Economist Sawada, you know, there's a risk that none of these vaccines work. Um, and, or they work, but they work at 50%. They require doses very frequently. They're not enough to get us out of the, out of the economic crisis or to fully solve the health issue. So we may need a new generation of vaccines. So keeping the R&D going is very important. And, you know, that is something where I think we do need, um, you know, we need, we need our existing national institutions, but I think there's huge gains from global institutions uh, uh, that would um, support additional R&D. Uh, how to get there, you know, uh, I don't know, but I think we do need new thinking on R&D and 
you know, public-private partnerships uh, are one of one of multiple tools that I, that is worth considering. Thanks very much for that. And so we have uh, the final set of questions, uh, all we have time for, uh, and these are related. So, how do you establish priorities for who should be given the vaccine, who will be given the vaccine? For example. Should teachers get higher priority because they have less equipment to protect themselves compared to, say, health workers? Professor Cranston. Uh, so, look, these will be you know, moral judgments that every society will, will come to. Um, I think it is worth, you know, one of the things that uh, the chief economist Sawada uh, uh, emphasized was you know, the importance of of learning and trying to improve what, what uh, improve our knowledge base, and I think one of the advantages of of better epidemiological knowledge is we can learn which groups are most vulnerable and which groups contribute the most to the spread of the epidemic. And so, you know, let me let me uh, uh, only somewhat adjust suggest. You know, yes, we care about teachers. Yes, we care about health workers. Meatpacking workers turn out to be very vulnerable. Well, if that's a place where spread is occurring, then we also need to go to the meatpacking workers as well. So uh, that's, you know, that's actually not a joke. We do need to think about them. And so we need to think, and we don't know enough. I think we need to know much more. We're learning, but we need to learn more. Is it maybe transport workers uh, are, are a really key group? Uh, to, you can easily imagine teachers being a very important group because they're exposed They'll, they'll naturally interact with lots of people. And you know, when we talk about the economic cost of the epidemic, you know, a key cost is the long run cost to human capital formation. Children are not getting immunized because their parents are afraid to take them in for immunizations uh, or the health workers aren't there because they're afraid. Um, similarly, a whole generation of children are missing school. So, Yes, it may well be that one of the priority groups should be the should be teachers. I, I don't want to. Uh, I you know these are going to be difficult judgments, and uh, I haven't studied this, but I think you know really we need better knowledge of the epidemiology so that societies as a, as a whole can come to appropriate judgment. One issue is there may be a shortage. Um, uh, almost certainly, there will be a shortage. I think you know we have seen progress to putting in some uh, additional capacity, but not enough. So we will have shortages, and we will have to decide who goes first, who's first in line. You know, one possibility that some have suggested is to have some sort of uh, have some lottery mechanism, and maybe you get higher up in the lottery if you're a health worker, if you're a teacher. Maybe you get to the very top. But there's going to be some area where there's going to be some uh, very hard, difficult decisions. If you do have some uh, lottery element, then that will help you. You can trace what the impact of that is. That will help you confirm vaccine safety because um, you know there may be trials. But if you're if you're going to investigate to give you know million, billions of people shots in arms, you really want to be sure of safety. So if there's a random component to this. That's useful for for you know further follow up study of safety. It's also useful for understanding is the vaccine efficacious in all populations or is it more efficacious in some than others. And it's also useful perhaps in understanding which which types of people um, are most get the most uh, have the most uh, impact on on the epidemic. So it may make sense to uh, to think about that. But these are these are complicated issues that I am not an expert on. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kramer. That was some really uh, helpful insights there. We've come to the end of our scheduled time, unfortunately, and it was truly uh, a rich and fruitful discussion. And uh, you've really helped stretch our thinking uh, on these issues that are just very, very uh, topical for us in ADB today, as you've heard. So from uh, the Asian Development Bank, I'd like to thank you, Professor Michael Kramer, for sharing your, your thinking with us and your valuable time today. I'd also like to thank the audience uh, for their active participation. And uh, I'd like to uh, also um, draw uh, colleagues' attention to the uh, fact that uh, we will be having another Asian impact webinar on harnessing 
data in the digital age for poverty reduction. This will be broadcast on the 14th of October, uh, at three o'clock Manila time. So uh, look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and one final, uh, just to repeat again, thank you very much, Professor Kramer. It was really great to have you with us here in ADB. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So uh, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, stay safe and uh, good evening.